Chapter 25 of Bazaar by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Bulka. On Chairs and Off. As a person who frequently sits, I should like to know why there are so many uncomfortable chairs. Why is it that people who are apparently mild and kind hearted will foster in their homes? at their very firesides, chairs of the most insidious cruelty. Why will dear old ladies cherish these household monsters, festooning them with ribbons and fancy work? Of course I realize that every chair represents some furniture maker's theory of beauty and comfort, that every lump, ridge, and crook is supposed to have its aesthetic or anatomic reason. What I object to is being tortured for heresy just because I am physically unable to agree with these theories. An innocent-looking willow rocker that stands invitingly on my aunt's veranda is built on the assumption that the human back is in the shape of an S. Perhaps the Apollo Belvedere may have a back like that, but not I. Mine, sitting in that rocker, feels more like the dying gladiators. I am fond of nature, and I have the greatest respect for her. But my joy in things sylvan does not extend to rustic chairs. As parlor additions of the woodpile, they are certainly ingenious, but their surface, which resembles that of a corduroy road, is hardly adapted to sitting purposes. Then, too, there are always a few nails in evidence, and I can never resist picking at the loose shreds of bark on the arms, with the result that before I know it I am sure to skin quite a large place, and then feel mortified. The city cousin of the rustic chair is the high-backed carved seat. This has a lion's head that catches you at the nape of the neck, and a couple of scrolls for your shoulder blades. The seat itself is a huge slab of wood that feels like adamant. This chair looks best against the wall, and the fact that it weighs about 50 pounds is one reason why it generally stays there. Another massive chair is the Morris. It indeed took the imagination of a poet to conceive of sitting on a folding bed that was only half folded. When I get into one of these contrivances, its bed-like quality makes me so drowsy that I almost fall asleep, yet its chair-like quality keeps me awake, with the result that I remain in a semi-comatose condition, from which I rouse myself occasionally to climb out and shift the rod to another notch. A variety that is not to be relied on, much less sat on, is the loop-the-loop -loop species which is found in cheap restaurants and at amateur theatricals. This consists of a four-legged tambourine, backed by two loops of wood, the outer one in the shape of a Moorish arch, and the inner one in the shape of a tennis racket. Exactly half of these chairs in existence have racks under them to hold your hat and gloves, whereas the other half have no such racks so that exactly half the times I sit on one of these chairs and put my hat and gloves under the seat, those articles fall disconcertingly to the floor. A kind of rocker much in vogue is a medley of young banisters, a sort of improvisation on a turning lathe. When new, this chair emits a peculiar creaking sound. In the course of a few weeks it loosens up till quite supple so that in rocking the various rods perform a complicated piston motion. This process continues till gradually the chair reaches the stage where at every rock it comes apart and puts itself together again, or almost together. Best parlor chairs run to extremes of fatness and leanness. They are either pampered, slender, gilded things, mere wisps of chairs, that offer a most precarious support, or fat, puffy, tufted affairs, satin feather beds on sticks. No, not feather beds, either, 
for they have twangy springs that tune up every time you sit on them. The colors of this latter variety may be endured in winter, but when summer comes it is necessary to suppress them with linen slips. One interesting species, the elevated rocker, is nearly extinct. This curious chair, able to skid on rollers like any other, has a little rocking department upstairs, so that it can wobble to and fro on its track without doing the least harm in the world. I could speak of the personal idiosyncrasies of chairs, such as the trick some of them have of shedding their casters at the slightest provocation. I could tell of the rocker that insisted on sliding away from a reading lamp, or the chair that, while not supposed to be a rocker at all, teetered diagonally on its northeast and southwest legs. But the chair I am now sitting on has given me such a cramp that I shall have to get up and take a walk. End of chapter 25